Thank you and welcome to another Chameleon Metadata educational tutorial. Today what we're going to talk about is multi-processing. We're going to use a very simple uh, Excel spreadsheet that is also highly uh, compute intensive when we write a program strip to do a nested loop through it. Um, while all of this is available, if in this case I went uh, to Google and typed Python space multiprocessing, and this is going to be the first um, result that, that I got at least, which is the manual. One thing we'll talk about, there's a bunch of different ways to use multiprocessing and parallelism in, in, uh, in Python and especially SageMaker. There's a couple differences in SageMaker that we're going to discuss, and we are going to talk about the pool example. Now, before we get started, Remember that there's different types of, um, of instances you can have with a notebook. If you're new to uh, SageMaker, you'll know that uh, an instance is a collection of notebooks. So if we go into something like this, we would see a bunch of notebooks. If we come in here, there's not many because I did it just for this class, but it's a collection of notebooks. So we want to be careful we're going to need multiple CPUs for this uh, multiprocessing to work, but I'd encourage you to start and do your debugging on a T2 or a T3 medium because it's so much cheaper. And uh, to make that home, we're going to be using this MLM5D 4X large. Now that costs about a dollar and eight and a half cents a minute these things get expensive. So make sure you keep an eye on things when you are um, setting up and, and using these and make sure to shut them down and, and stop the notebook afterwards or you'll continue to get billed. All right, now that housekeeping's out of the way, let's take a quick look at what we're going to be doing. The base is pretty simple. We're going to take a uh, a... Excel sheet. It's a CSV. I'm using Excel here um, because you can't save shading in a CSV, and we'll use it later in the course. So I've just got some King, um, some Monty Python and the Holy Grail. The the point being, whether it's a financial report or a, uh, a Internet of Things or a piece of lab equipment, whatever, usually comes with a few uh, lines of header, and you have to deal with those. So we're going to do that as well. And then in this case, think of an Internet of uh, Things data set where it's looking for conditions. If it sees nothing, it's a zero. So we're going to ignore those. And in our case, we have a one, a two, and a three. So here's some threes. Here's some twos. And what we care about in a lot of these applications are we care about where there's an edge between one and two. Now, as I said before, we're not going to be considering one and zero because it's not it's it's not an interactive edge. It's an exterior edge. We're only looking for interior edges. And again, don't worry so much about what it is. We just needed something to be compute heavy. So what it's going to do is it's going to look and see, is this the same? Is this the same? If they are, no edge. In this case, this is not the same. So there's an edge to the left but no edge to the to upwards. So that's basically what we're going to do. Um, I put both the, uh, the CSV and the, um, and the Excel, which is shaded, up on our uh, GitHub, and you just go in and look for Chameleon Metadata on the GitHub. So I'll put a link to that on the YouTube when I post it. So what are we going to do? We're going to import date time to give us some timestamps. PS utility, we're going to use just to show us how many CPUs the machine has. We're going to use the pool method of multiprocessing. And we're also going to use a, uh, a memory manager for a memory namespace that will allow us for uh, to share memory between the calling script. And in this case, we've got a function called compare adjacent matrix cells. Um, these are the ways we're going to set up the, man the namespace and the memory manager. We're going to need NumPy and Pandas, and we're going to use time to calculate the elapsed time 
and we're going to do some sleep exercises, which we can see down here, and we'll talk about that to reduce contention. So let's get started. In most cases on SageMaker, I'm just using a basic Conda 3 kernel. Uh, you shouldn't have to um, install anything. So we'll import that, and if you download the script that's on the GitHub, it tells me, as we saw in the uh, earlier slide from Amazon comparing the costs, this has 16 cores because we're using that type of a machine, and it's I don't even know if it's scientific anymore at this point. I just feel it's always good practice to leave one CPU for overhead and not stress the machine. The other thing we'll find, it is not always the case that more CPUs are better. All right, let's look at what's going to happen here. We'll talk about the multi-run wrapper in a moment. Let's just look at the compare matrix cells. We'll talk about NS. This is going to be shared memory. But it's going to take a row pointer because what we're going to do is feed this one row at a time. So we might give it row 46, which remember in our Python index would be row 45, because instead of 1 to 46, Python tracks 0 to 45. So row 46, and it's going to go across, and it's going to check. Can't check left, it'll check up. Then it'll check left. Then it'll check up. And it'll go across the row, and when it's done, it will return. Um, and you can look at the code. It's just simple code that does a nested loop. It's going to return a list with three lists. Now, I did this a little bit on purpose just because we want to talk about how the lists are different once they're returned. So we'll get back to that in a second. But bottom line, it comes in. It gives it the row. And it checks the column pointer to, it checks over here how big is the column pointer. Uh, I mean, uh, how many columns are there by checking the columns on the length of the columns on the data frame. And then, like I said, we're going to look at the column and we're going to look left. So that's minus one. And then we're going to look up, which is plus one. So it just does that. Here's the column minus one. And then this point is just checking that um, we're not at the top row, because if it's up here, if we go up a little bit, if I'm at the top row, there's nothing to check upwards. And the code you'll see checks the first numeric row as being seven or index six. So unless we get to index seven or row eight, we won't check up. And it does the same thing for the column. It makes sure that the column uh, is, is greater than zero. Because if not, it's at the uh, it's at the left edge, and there's no way to check to the left. Again, pretty simple. When we come through, we're going to fill three lists. This is the coordinates, the row and column. We're going to give it the anchor. The anchor. If we're checking this cell, it's the anchor. This is the delta left, and this is the delta up. So we're going to calculate all three. And we set everything to zero because we don't care about it in the beginning. We're going to just check that. In any event, we're going to get all the columns, all the rows in this one. When we start getting to this, we're only going to sit, cha start checking and, and uh, populating the lists and appending the lists if there's a difference. So back to our list. Again, we're not doing zeros. So if we look here, this would not be anything we care about because it's zero to one. This would be. Now, what we'll find is that that plays games with the indexes and everything has uh, different values. So we're going to do the, the delta up and the uh, delta left. And that will have its own color pairs list. And then we're also going to keep, regardless, the color of the uh, cell itself without regard to what it is, and we'll append that. So three lists, uh, coordinates, the anchor, and the two deltas. We're going to get the cell uh, value if it's non-zero and count it, ones, twos, and threes. And then we're going to get the interior edges where one meets two, two meets three, and three meets one. Um, if you look at the code, too, we just check so that the uh, – the um, the higher values always to the left. 
That way we don't get one value for three meets one and another for one meets three. That's the only reason that's there. So we're going to pull in, remember on the uh, GitHub, I've got both the CSV and the, um, and the Excel because I'm using the Excel here because it's shaded. Another important thing, if you're going to get this to work, we need to do it inside an if name equal main. So that allows this cell to act as the controller and, and monitor the workers in the pool. And in our case, we're going to give it a pool of 15, but we'll talk about that in a minute. First thing, though, make sure it's inside a name equal main block. Now, a lot of this you might not need. Um, I've just put this in a little bit for the um, the uh, the class, and we've got a colors value list and a colors pair list. So we'll be looking at those as we go through. Now, how does this work? Well, we're going to grab the start time, and this will be for elapsed time, and that's different than the date time date time where we're just going to give it a uh, timestamp to say it began. We're going to use this. And then at the bottom, we'll grab the time again, and then we'll take that and divide by 60 to get us the minutes. So that's what we're doing there. Then we're going to read the CSV file that's at the top of this code block into a pandas data frame. We need to know this because we want to know how many rows there are and how many columns there are. And uh, in that case, we've got this. Now, here's where you need to pay attention. This is all normal stuff. You read to a data frame and you check some stuff out. Notice that what we're doing here is we're reading in that data frame to NumPy. Now, that would be how it would normally be. But remember, we were talking about the NS. Now, let's go back up to the top. The NS is the namespace with manager, which is the memory manager, which is part of multiprocessing. So what we're doing here is we've said, and, and look down here, we're going to call NS as the first parameter. So that means if I was to say uh, NS variable underscore 01 equals 666, both of these are going to go in because they're prefixed with NS. Do as many as you want. It'll all go over in an NS namespace for the memory. But also, be careful because you only want to give it what's absolutely necessary. So the other thing I've noticed in personal, the NS sometimes stalls when I try because you should be able to do this, NS like that. But sometimes the data frame stalled, so you'll see... I, I, I make a data frame. Let's get rid of this because that was just an example. And I, I take it to NumPy and I'm going to pass it in. Now, some of the other things, if you remember, we've got at the top some nonsense. This is just like I say, out of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. But it might be the name of the financial analyst, the CIK number, if you're looking at an Edgar 10K report. Could be a bunch of things when the report was pulled. If it's Internet of Things or lab equipment, might be serial numbers, what was being analyzed, things like that. But in any event, I need to find out where that first numeric row is because I don't want to start doing my calculations on these text rows because they, it makes no sense. I'm just looking for the equipment values. So very common thing. I'm going to store the first numeric row in uh, a variable that I'm going to pass. So I'm going to give it a row pointer. We'll get to that in a second. The row count, so I know how many rows are in the entire thing. And then the first numeric row, so I know what to skip over. Now, this is important. If we go back to multiprocessing, there are, you can use pools with maps, you can use process with map and process with star map. There's a lot of options. I generally find I use the pool the most. I've also found that on anything that runs per iteration less than a minute, if you run this, say, with a 96-core machine with even 90 cores, I found it doesn't go much faster. 
So the longer the iterative task, like in this case, the longer it takes the program to parse each row, the more workers. This one ends up taking about 30 or so seconds. So with the sleeps and the calls, 15, 20. I just did 15 because, uh, you know, I didn't need that huge machine. And the next one has 48 and it's like four bucks an hour. So I'm going to do that. The other thing with pool, you need an iterative variable. So in this case, the reason I read the CSV file and I got the row count was so that I could pass iteratively the row in the range zero to the row count. Now this has 100 rows, so it'll go 99, zero to 99. This all should be pretty easy. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna store the results, which remember are gonna be this list of three lists coming back in a uh, meta variable called results. And then we'll take that results to uh, a data frame and then we'll play some games with it later. Let's look at a couple things though. I'm going to assign the pool uh, 15 workers. As we saw up ahead, this uh, has 16 cores, so 15 or less would be the maximum. I don't know if that's an Amazon rule, but I would suggest you go with it. Just use one less or use a bigger machine. Like I said, even on a 48 machine, for this one, it tends to slow down after about 23 workers, and we'll show why. So what it's going to do is it's going to read the data frame up at the top here. It's going to turn it into a NumPy array and send it into the memory space, which means when I call, that'll be available to anything called by this. I'm going to send over three other variables, the row count and the first numeric row. When it's when each row comes back, it'll it'll queue up in a results. And when the last worker is done, this will finish and the results will go to a data frame, and we're gonna close the pool. Now, a couple notes on this. This pool map, as far as I've read, does not need a pool close, but there's other parts of multiprocessing like process map and process star map or S map. They specifically should have a pool close. My experience, it doesn't do anything when I'm doing a pool map. So I just put it in always. And it's the same idea. You should always close a file. I don't know if it does anything, but I just use it for good coding practice. And then what we're going to do, if you remember up here, we're going to return three lists. The first return list has, as I said, it's got everything. It's got the row and column. It's got the anchor and the two deltas, so we can see everything that's going on. So that should be a one-to-one. -one. There should be one entry in there for each cell here. That's a going to be results index zero. Color values list, how many ones versus twos versus threes. Remember, we're not looking at zeros. You can see it in the code. And then the color pairs list. And that comes down to when there's a non-zero edge like this two to one, we call that an edge and that would be a two to one pair. The code also says, even if it's one to two, we're still gonna put the higher value first, just so we don't have an entry for one, two and two, one, cause they're the same thing. They're an edge between one and two. So when we go through this, and then we'll talk a little bit about the locks in a second, but we're gonna go through this. We're going to append Remember, we had these two lists up here that we had empty. We don't really need to do a list of the first one because it's going to be every cell. But these won't give me anything. Like over here, where it's zero, zero, there's going to be nothing there. There's nothing for this. There is going to be only these kind of things where it's an internal change. So that's going to be index, or the color value, I'm sorry. The individual won't count zero, will count the number of ones and the number of twos. The other one will look at the edges internally. And that's this third one, the color pairs list. We've got this uh, these two empty lists. We're going to go through. We're going to fire this up and we'll talk about what's going on with the multi run wrapper because it takes about 90 seconds to run. Pull the results in. 
write them to a data frame, close the pool, and then we're going to send to the list the color values, that's our counts, and then we're going to set our color pairs, and those would be our internal edges, and I even put in the display for values greater than zero. So for right now, let's make sure we fired this up. So we're going to load the uh, proc in. And so now that's loaded in. We restarted one, gave us our pool and our CPU count. Two, we've got the multi-run wrapper, which we'll talk about in a second. And then the function we care about is now in memory. And then this is going to read the CSV inside the name equal main, very important, so it acts as a controller. We're going to call the multi one wrapper, which we'll see in a minute, which will call our function and do what I just ran through. So let's get it started. Now you'll notice a couple things. Six rows start right away. Remember, because it's not going to do anything because they're non numeric, we have 15 workers. So there you're going to see a group of another. Um, another nine fire up, and you'll see that there's two sets of timestamps. The six will fire up, they don't have much to do, then the first nine will fire up, and then you'll see that they go in six and nine groups as each group finishes. Uh, another quick note this is great to do when you're debugging. Because one of the frustrating things I found, especially when using multiprocessing in pool, is there's been times I had problems reading a data frame or something, and it'll just stop. It'll just stall. So it's good to know at least the thing's running. It's almost at the end. It's going to go to row 99 and then calculate these results. In While that happens, let's take another quick thing. I've assigned a lock to the multiprocessing lock. And in the same way Pandas, I did multiprocessing as MP, like Pandas is PD and NumPy is MP, uh, NP. So what I'm doing is I'm setting a lock variable and say, give me a locking mechanism in the, in the multiprocessing manager. Now, I'm going to send in the pool of 15. Remember that this NumPy array is going in in the memory. Now, even with 15 workers, when it comes in, it gets NS. In our case, we only loaded it with NumPy, but anything you put in it will be available as long as you also suffix, uh, prefix it with an NS. Uh, we've got the row count in the first numeric row, so it knows not to screw around with those, uh, you know, the Monty Python quote lines or the machine header or the financial report disclaimers or whatever it is. And it comes in. Now, here's what happens. I'm going to acquire this lock. That means that nothing else can run through this, this process until I release the lock. So I'm going to acquire the lock, quickly read the NumPy, uh, the, the uh, NumPy array that was passed in as part of NS. We know that because it has the NS in front, into a data frame, sleep for three one hundredths of a second just to give it a stagger and then release the lock. And what that does is it queues up all the other things behind it. Now, that's how this works. If you remember, we didn't call this function with these four variables. We called the multi-run wrapper. And this is another way that will help the system coordinate all the workers that are running in the pool. So what I do is down here, I don't call compare adjacent matrix cells. In the call below, I call the multi-run wrapper, which just says return the function with the arguments I pass it, which of course were down here. And those are my arguments. And so what happens is each time we go through this row pointer iteration, goes through row zero, row one, and it fires it up here, which passes it down here, and then actually this return is coming out and it, it doesn't need to bounce back. But that's you need that, uh, that multi-run wrapper to try and coordinate the workers. So what are the main points here? Number one, the multi-run wrapper, you call with the arguments, pass them like I've done at the top of block two here to the function itself. And you notice you, point, you call the multi-run wrapper with the arguments as, as a group item 
and pass it down and un unpack them there. It goes through. We're making sure we're acquiring the lock before we read anything in the NS space, doing a tiny sleep just to stagger it, and then releasing the lock so the next worker can come in behind it. When that's all done, the results will come back row by row. When they're done, this step will return and be passed to this one, where we move the results into a data frame. And although with the, the pool map, the, the documentation says you don't need it. There's no reason not to do that. So now we're going to go through and we'll show this in a couple things. The numeric row counts, and you'll notice that I just take it and I divide by 100 over the entire count to get what percent of ones, twos, and threes, and then the color values. So, and again, when you go into production, you would, uh, you would want to remove this line. There's, you know, and maybe even all the all the displays, uh, especially if it's in a lambda function. So these wouldn't be here. They're there for debugging and also to make sure you can see it's still running. When we get to the color proportions, it goes through and then it divides. And so 31 and a half percent one. I just made this up. And then we see the different color pairs. Two meets one or one meets two 31 times. One meets three or three meets one 12 times, and the same for two and three, 26 times. The whole thing took about a minute and a third, and that's what we're going to do. Now, let's look at a couple things, though, real quick, because this can throw, especially if you're getting, if you're not really that comfortable with functions, this actually applies outside of multiprocessing, so it's pretty cool. We're returning a list of lists. This list has five items, this list has one item, and this list has two items, okay? Uh, and the two items happen where a two meets a three or a one meets a three. So if we look at row 62, and let's go down here, and remember row 62 is really row 63 in... Uh, 63 is the index value 62. Just remember that. They're all off by one. So when you see that, that's why I'm highlighting row 63. All right. Now, if we look and we say, what's the member of the first list? First, let's do that. And then what we'll see is we're going to see a list item for everything, every single cell. Okay. I'm only doing row 62. But there would be an entry in that list all the way over to ALM, that, that column here, ALM. And uh, so that list is an inventorying list. So when we do the whole thing, it's huge, and it doesn't matter. If we look just at this list, what's on index 62 or line 63, for the first list, and at column 12 to 13, it turns out this is M63 in the shade. And what's on the next line, 63, which is line 64 in Excel, first list, 12th item, is M65. And we'll see here that there's our list. So at 62.2 is a 1 with nothing different on either side of it. So 62, 1, doesn't count zeros, that's the same. We go down one row for 12, and we see it's M64. Now, how come this one's different? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't record anything. So 0, 0 means on 12, it was, it was 1 or 0 to the left and above it. Now, on 3, it's the same to the left. But there is a 1, 3 or a 3, 1 edge. So we calculate that one. Now, if we had this, and of course, if we had like that with a 2, um, I'm going to put it back, then we'd have a 1, 2 here. So let me go Z, Z for that. Uh, that's a 1, and that's a 0 to get it back to what it was. Okay, so we see in the first list, we're at absolute position. Now, we're always going to be absolute position from the rows because that's just an index.
But notice the color pairs isn't going to start counting till 12. So 12 in the first list is the 12th column. 12 in the second list is 1. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So on the second list, that's the 12th one. Notice that the first one is in M. The first three on the next row is in I. So the first row for that list, this is just counting the single colors, is there. Okay, so let's look at what that one looks like. So you notice same row, different list, but we'll see now that what the relative 12th position, remember how big this one was? I'll just do it one more time. This was huge, and it's got everything. So 62, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's all zeros. All right, so it gave you one for each column on row 62. Well, on this one, on row 62, which is 63, there's only a few ones and twos, and that's here. And they go all the way to there. So those are the only ones. So what's 12 absolute with the first list, 12 is these three squares. And again, this 12 is to the left because the non-zeros start to the left. And we see that, that when we look at the green shaded, and I've even put this in here for you, that's why 12 to 13 here is not this on the second list, because we only start counting when we get to a non-zero, and things get even nuttier when we look at the last list, because this one is only going to look at things where two meets three, one meets three, two meets one. So there's far fewer of those. And when we look at those, we'll we'll point the whole row, just like we did here. Here's the whole row for list one. And list one is the single color values. Hold on right there. Single color values. This one has two colors in it. But if you look at the script, we concatenated them and then put a, uh, a colon. So they're one item lists. And then when we go through that, there'll be far fewer. Notice, this is very interesting, on row 62, which is 63 on the Excel, there's only one edge. So let's look at that. 63, as we go over, everything's the same. Now, in the red square, as I said in the code, red square, okay, uh, oh, two things. In the red square, there's that. There's only one. Notice when we try 12 to 13, like we did every other time, we get an empty value. That's this guy. That's because there's only one item in the list. See? That's the entire list. Now, this one has more items, and the 12th, it actually has 12. But I bring this up to show you that when you're adding these lists this way with a a uh, multiprocessor, not all the return lists will be the same. So with that, I think we've covered everything we did. We want to make sure PSUtil is only done for the CPU counter. Remember to use a multi-run wrapper and call the function rather than calling it directly. We remember NS is the first parameter when we want to use the memory and manager namespace from multiprocessing. We're going to acquire a lock anytime we're going to access NS material, sleep it for a tiny fraction of a second, and release it. We're also going to come down here. We read the file, always fire it off from if name equal main. I've got a few things you probably don't need. Here's where I'm going to collect the list that don't have a value for every row. This one, every column in every row, this one does, so we don't need a list for him. We read the CSV file, we read it into NumPy with the NS in front, which means when I call it with NS as the first parameter, it's available up in the function when I look to read that NumPy back to a data frame. We also see that we're going to use the lock manager, which is how you can acquire and release the locks. We call multiprocessing MP 
the same way we call pandas PD. Um, the results are going to run. You always need an iterative variable to call. In our account, we're using uh, the row pointer. And in the row pointer, we're going to go through the, the range, which we checked here. When it's done, the results will be collected, and it'll be a data frame with a list of three lists. We'll close the pool, not necessarily needed. We look at uh, collecting list one and two, which are the second and third list, because the first list is zero. Then we come down here and we, you know, it prints off some statistics. And then we did a little, a little uh, review of why item 12 is going to be different in all three lists. So with that, I uh, encourage you to stay tuned. I'll post a link on YouTube to the GitHub, which will have the notebook and the uh, data set. And uh, do drop me a line if, or in the comments section if you have any questions. Until then, this is Eric Thornton from Chameleon Metadata, and thanks for joining me. Bye-bye.